Hello, everyone. We miss geeking out with Perry and are happy to be back now sharing Perry with all of you. So what to geek out on next? We started examining very frequently asked questions that Perry could help explain. One that we are often asked is regarding in-place upgrades versus rolling migration. Welcome back, Perry. Thank you. So why does Exchange not do in-place upgrades? Why do we do rolling migrations? Well, it's mostly because Exchange is filled with a bunch of lazy developers who'd rather go home early at the end of the day than provide important things for customers. Uh, actually, the real reason is uh, we've made, over the last few releases, some significant storage changes that make it uh, really uh, difficult to do uh, in-place upgrades. Uh, if you think back, uh, the first time we did this was the upgrade from 2003 to 2007, mm -hmm. and we were seeing a very important shift in the industry from 32 bits to 64 bits. We made a, a really important decision to go 64-bit only, since all of the deployments on 2003 and earlier were 32-bit versions, and we could make really important storage optimizations for 64 bits if we went 64-bit only. It really eliminated any ability to do an in-place upgrade. Okay. That was a tough decision at the time. Uh, marketing was really concerned that it would be a big blocker. But when we looked at the hard data, our customers largely were doing uh, migrations. Um, well more than 80% of the people who upgraded 2003 uh, had done a migration uh, approach. And almost all of the rest had done uh, an in-place upgrade followed by a hardware migration. Okay. If you look at uh, sort of the upgrade periods, it tends to be about three to five years. Uh, when the cu customers refresh their environments. Mm -hmm. In that time, there are dramatic hardware changes that are going on, right? Uh, um, uh, the capacity in your disk drives are gonna go six to eight X okay. uh, in dollars uh, per storage. There's gonna be substantial improvements in uh, dollars per unit of CPU. And your user base is gonna change its activity rates. Yeah. So rethinking your hardware story at this point uh, makes a lot of sense, especially since over this period, your disk drives are wearing out. Okay. Right, And you can see this in warranties coming to the end and the uh, increased costs of storage. So if, if you're going to re refresh your software on this time frame, it makes a lot of sense to link your hardware refresh and your software refresh and do one uh, refresh involving a migration. So uh, that is what we did with 2007 and it worked really well. Um, we saw, you know, a lot of good thinking in terms of uh, taking advantage of the new hardware and re-architecting the systems and getting those deployed correctly, uh, and it, it came together nicely. Since then, we, you know, we think we've been on this uh, uh, need to stay on this trajectory where um, the size of the disk drives is growing okay. uh, by factor two every 18 months or so on. That uh, each release, we're going to have to do significant uh, storage. Uh, improvements that require changes at the physical uh, layout layer. Okay. It's very difficult to build a system that will translate a database that's on the same disk drive uh, and in place, modify all those records and put them in the new format that allows us to be uh, more efficient and do that in a way that is reliable. Um, the nice thing about migration story is you bring up new hardware and you start moving mailboxes one at a time. If there are any issues with the new design or the system, you can stop after the first couple of uh, mailboxes. Okay. You can migrate a couple mailboxes, test things out, and see how they go. When you do an in-place upgrade, you kind of have this big red switch. You turn it on, and it's really difficult to go back, usually. So that's really great for the storage story. But what about the other server roles? Why don't we do in-place upgrades for some of the other server roles that we have? Well, if you think about the exchange as a whole system, uh, we now have a set of roles. You've got front-end servers, and they're talking to mailbox servers. Mm -hmm. And then you've got some transport servers, or hubs. They're going to route your mail. Mm -hmm. And you've got a whole, basically got a whole system. As we add functionality and make changes to our store here, our protocols tend to change across this, these interfaces, right? So um, the, uh, uh, one of the, the, the important things to recognize is if you uh, don't uh, sort of swap out the whole system, mm -hmm. you need to end up building in a whole bunch of backwards compatibility functionality into your front ends. That actually, it's turned out, has been uh, uh, a place where it's been tough to... Uh, Maintain the backwards compatibility in a way that's seamless 
and introduce new functionality. Okay. Um, and uh, also within the upgrade story, you get in some weird things in which um, uh, uh, a user might switch between two front ends, uh, one that had been in place upgraded and one not, because these guys are stateless, and be switching between two different views, okay. even though his mailbox has actually been upgraded behind him. So when you work through the, the whole system, we think this actually ends up being a cleaner story. More importantly, though, from the customer perspective, it isn't just the storage is getting better, it's also the CPU, right? Mm -hmm. And the user behavior is changing over time. Uh, every few years, we're seeing uh, about a 5% e uh, increase each year on overall message traffic and usage of email within companies per person. Mm -hmm. So over time, it doesn't take very long before uh, a properly designed system starts getting a little bit overloaded. Okay. And when you buy a, a new version of Exchange, you're usually interested in some of the new functionality. This creates new load on the system. So taking advantage of the CPU in, uh, improvements um, uh, to counteract that increasing use of email and the increased uh, feature set you want to take advantage of requires re-architecting your whole system and building a new uh, system that uh, can meet the needs and takes advantage of the current sets of hardware. So That's great. What have we done with Exchange 2010 in order to make the process easier for our customers? So uh, in Previous releases, the uh, um, the moves pretty much had to take place after hours. And as mailboxes grew, uh, in 2007, we did a lot of work introducing our replication uh, uh, strategy for data protection that allowed mailboxes to grow a lot bigger. So it became more and more difficult to isolate the moves to uh, mm -hmm. off-peak hours when users uh, wouldn't matter. And as mailboxes grew bigger, users' mailboxes would be offline for longer while the move was going on. So the single biggest thing that we did to improve this was to enable uh, online moves between versions. So between 2007 and 2010, okay. uh, your mailbox moves can actually occur during your migration period 24 by 7, uh, and the users will see absolutely no impact on, on the moves. So um, the... Uh, the uh, impact on user productivity is very low, mm -hmm. and uh, you can get it done very quickly because you have all the hours in the day to, to move the mailboxes across. Okay, thank you, Perry. Thanks for tuning in. It's good to be back and geeking out with Perry. We hope you enjoyed this installment, so please send your questions, feedback, and we'll geek out again.